Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, today's topic, I want to discuss the pros and cons of an annuity and go into uh, pretty good detail regarding why somebody may decide to go with an annuity, what are the different types of annuities, what are some of the problems with some of the more popular annuities, and how to decipher to determine whether or not it might be you know, best for your specific situation to help you reach one of your financial goals. Primarily, annuities are leveraged for retirement planning, whether that be retirement income planning or some sort of accumulation planning, or even in some circumstances, try to maximize out like a, like a death benefit that you're trying to leave an account aside you know, for a beneficiary. So I'm going to go through some of the different things that I've seen, um, that some of the things that I, I've, I you know, really wished individuals would avoid. And, uh, you know, at any point in time, if you have questions, feel free to give our 1-800 number a call. It's 1-800-566-1002. And make sure to reference this video so we could be sending you, you know, the correct reports, the correct uh, information to really help educate you on the differences of the different annuities and see whether it might be a viable solution for what you're trying to do. So to get started, an individual, they may leverage an annuity specifically to accomplish a lifetime income goal, meaning some sort of cash flow need. When somebody is in retirement or they're nearing retirement, it all comes down to the math of, if I'm no longer working, well then I'm no longer going to be receiving some sort of income in retirement. I have to now rely on my assets. So different, I guess, cash flow related assets, as you could put it, would be social security income and would be pension income. So a pension is the defined benefit plan. That's if you're working for an employer that offers a pension plan. Unfortunately, the majority of individuals are not offered pension plans through their employer. So typically that's omitted from consideration. But let's say if somebody was receiving $30,000 as an example from social security income, and they did have a pension income stream, and that was maybe so call it another 20,000. So in total, they have $50,000 of monies that would come to them when they hit their ideal retirement age. And but if they're doing their budgeting analysis and the amount of money that they actually need is seventy thousand dollars, well, we understand that there's a twenty thousand dollar gap there. So an individual could use an annuity to produce them that type of lifetime income cash flow and doing it through a type of insurance route, meaning placing their monies into a type of account that's going to produce them income every month, every year to the day that they pass away or the day that them and their spouse passes away. So an individual could place monies aside. They could leverage non-IRA monies like cash monies, non-qualified accounts. They could leverage traditional IRAs. So whether that means they've accumulated monies from their 401k or their 403b, 457, their savings plan, whatever that is, a qualified retirement account, and they're rolling it over into a traditional IRA, they could create a traditional IRA with an annuity, and they could do the same thing with a Roth IRA. So how it's created, there's a large misconception that individuals think, oh, I only could place cash monies or non-IRA monies in there, and that's not the case. Basically, with traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs, you could customize them to make sure that they're within annuity chassis that would say, I'm giving X amount of dollars, it's creating this type of IRA account, and then I'm going to, I'm going to turn on the spigot when I hit, you know, uh, age 65 as an example, or 67 or 62, really whatever their ideal retirement date is. So that's a benefit because it's, it's ultimately an insurance that somebody could not outlive their money. It's just like how life insurance is an insurance that if somebody passes away too soon, the beneficiaries would receive a lump sum death benefit. It protects that person from dying too soon. It protects their family from dying too soon. The complete opposite side of that would be income related annuities, uh, and their income riders, which are more, some of the more attractive options now, that's the opposite of that. Saying, okay, if I'm giving a lump sum to an insurance company, I want to make sure that I'm receiving income that I cannot outlive. On top of it, I do not want this income to be variable. I want to make sure that it's at least, if my gap is $20,000, I want to create a strategy that's, that, uh, that makes sure that I place the smallest dollars and only as much as necessary into the correct plan into the correct account that's going to generate me $20,000. Uh, if let's say you have, you want to incorporate for inflation, well, then you could also create laddering strategies to step up with that income as well. So you could ladder these things out. The problem that occurs is you have an individual that when they were working, they were constantly trying to accumulate their dollars. 
and they were in an accumulation phase, a wealth accumulation phase to try to grow as much money as possible, grow as much money as possible, take on as much risk as possible. So that was the first step of financial planning. What they typically get wrong is where they start nearing that retirement stage and now they say, okay, how can I properly preserve my wealth? How could I do a wealth preservation and distribution strategy? The distribution strategy this is a really important tool to use for that distribution plan and what, allowing an individual to leave certain pieces to say, okay, if I need X amount of dollars to complete my gap, I could go and leverage a product, a tool to do so, such as an annuity, because this will produce me a much higher cash flow than what I could do from an investment standpoint. The investment standpoint does not have the guarantee that has ultimately a question mark because you have sequence of returns risk, you have volatility, you have fees, you have downward market loss potential, you have withdrawals that you're taking out of that account. So you ultimately have the power of compound interest that could hurt an individual situation when they're trying to leverage a jack of all trades type strategy. There's a purpose and there's a place for annuities regarding them for income. And there's also a purpose in place to leverage investments when you're trying to utilize that for a growth related strategy where an income annuity would not fit that mold. That would be an absolute horrible thing to use if you're trying to grow, grow, grow your monies. So as long as you're looking at different things like a puzzle piece and say, okay, how can I use the most efficient route? How can I make sure that if I have, let's say if you have an individual that has a million dollars of assets between the combination of IRA, Roth IRA, uh, non-IRA cash accounts, uh, you know, 401k accounts, whatever that is, and their gap is $20,000 is in the example, well, that doesn't mean that they're taking the full $1 million, placing it into the top annuity and calling it a day and say, oh, I'm going to get, you know, $90,000 of extra cash flow that I don't need. All I need is 20 grand. No, what you would do is this person would put aside and say, okay, based on the top options, maybe out of my $1 million nest egg, you'll know, splice throughout all these different accounts. I'm going to create a customized IRA that would be set up in an, in an, uh, an IRA annuity for 200000 and by waiting two years, three years, five years, whatever that case is, whatever the math that comes back, this is what's going to produce me with my $20,000 of cash flow. Well, in that example, now this person has 800000 remaining. And now they could dabble, leave some money in emergency needs, leave some money in growth, so into inflationary needs. You know, there's a whole multitude of things. But that's where individuals get it wrong is they just try to either risk it 100% or throw too much money into safety and too much money into an income play. And that's where they, they, it hurts themselves on the flexibility options. And really they, they typically go into an inferior product where they could save thousands of dollars in the process by just taking their time and understanding how the math works with these sorts of accounts. The other aspect to touch up on is if you need to accomplish a cash flow strategy, if you have a gap, use the best cash flow related tool to do so. Don't do something that's going to be a jack of all trades. Don't do something that, yes, I might have some growth, but it might go down and I might outlive my monies, but maybe I'm going to be much older so I can move in with my kids to do that. You know, basically, if there's a way that you could win the game without taking on as much risk, why would you not want to do that? So that's where we see the mistakes where somebody does not stick to their lane. They are not leveraging the correct tool for that strategy. So there's a difference between a cash flow related strategy and a growth related strategy. Just like how investments aren't ideal for a cash flow related situation, in, uh, annuities might not be ideal for a max growth related situation. Always remember that there's different types of annuities. And that's something that individuals get wrong time and time again. There's not just a one size fits all related annuity. You're going to use them just like any sort of tool. If you're leveraging investments and you want to have large growth within your account and you want that you know, tied to the market like the S&P 500, then you typically leverage some sort of stock or some sort of index to do so. Same sort of co concept. You're not going to be leveraging a commodity. You're not going to leverage a bond to try to get a stock-related need and that stock-related growth. It's going to have different risk, different return metrics. When you're utilizing an annuity, you have and that really the three main ones that I like, especially in the current interest rate environment, especially with what's going on with the volatility in the market, unfortunately, since you know, November of 2021, um, is you have fixed annuities, you have fixed indexed annuities, and then you also have hybrid annuities. Now, hybrid annuities are not including variable annuities with income riders. Variable annuities, I put the entire variable annuity ca category in the cons list. Why did I do that? 
because variable annuities are an absolute shitty product. I will argue it. I will explain everything with it. I'm going to have a whole video series. Variable annuities with income riders, in my mind, there's absolutely no justification for somebody to get put into a variable annuity with an income rider. There's a lot of hidden fees. There's a lot of negatives. And at the end of the day, the cash flow guarantee that a variable annuity produces is not as high as a hybrid annuity with a fixed index annuity with an income rider. Even if you're leveraging a SPIA or a DIA, deferred income annuity, or SPIA is a single premium immediate annuity, those are better on the cash flow side, better on the safety side than what a variable annuity does with masking and, and hiding and basically have a whole smoke and mirrors effect. With the fixed annuities and the fixed indexed annuities, if you're not looking to add riders like a death benefit rider or an income rider or anything like that, and you're just looking at it solely as an accumulation play, these are going to be tied to what the current interest rate environment is. Interest rates were historically at all-time lows for a long time after the year 2000. Well, now we have the Fed that's increasing interest rates. Every time the Fed's increasing interest rates, it's making fixed index annuities and fixed annuities more attractive. The main difference between these are fixed annuities, everything's going to be fixed. It's going to say if you're getting a, you know, a 4% rate of return on a three year, uh, fixed annuity known as a MIGA, that means after the first year, you're going to get 4%. So if somebody put in a hundred thousand, they're going to get 4% the first year. The next year, if they didn't pull out any money, they're going to get 4% of 104,000. The next year, it's going to be 4% of that higher number. So you have the power of compound interest that's working in their favor. Because it's fixed, if the market goes down, they're getting 4%. If the market goes up, they're getting 4%. Everything is fixed within that sort of account. After that duration has been completed, then an individual is just basically sitting there, could take the, could take their monies and place it into whatever the next best thing is at that time, whether it be a three year, a two year, a five year, a seven year, a 10 year. There's a whole multitude of different fixed related annuities. And that might serve an individual's purpose. The other aspect and really what's getting very attractive today are uncapped indexing strategies through fixed index annuities. So you have uh, an annuity that works similar to the fixed, except for your, your money is going to be principal protected, is going to be, uh, you know, growth protected, meaning that if you go and this individual puts $100,000 and let's say that they were in a seven year fixed index annuity without an income rider and it was tied to a specific index with an uncapped indexing strategy. And let's just say that index gains 12% the first year. Then it loses 10% the second year. Then it gains 17% the third year. Then it gains 3% the fourth year. Then it loses 20% the fifth year. What exactly in those first five years, what was the credits? Well, if you have a hundred percent uncapped with a zero percent floor with this fixed index annuity, their account would have grown 12% the first year. They would have, because the index came back negative the second year, they would gain zero. The next year gained 17, they'd gain 17. The next year it gained three, they'd gain three. The next year it lost 20, they'd gain zero. So they started over here. Their index value was going up. Their, their physical money was increasing whenever those indexes were increasing and gaining 0% whenever the indexes went down. There was no riders with it. There was no additional fees with it. And it was an attractive option for the individuals that says, I want to participate in the market. I want to get some growth whenever the market's doing well. I want to have a higher potential rate of return than a fixed account. But if the market goes south and it takes a shit and, and, you know, it's, it's basically just Armageddon and doomsday situation. I do not want to be left holding the bag and, and having my entire portfolio, my entire retirement dreams crushed because of this downward market losses. And also to add insult to injury, if they're leveraging investments, they'd have to pay additional fees for that. They'd have to pay fees for the expense ratios for the funds that they're going into. They might have to pay a financial advisor fee. If they're pulling monies from that account, that's negative. So, you know, what fixed index annuities do, it's, it just gives consistency and produces a higher potential rate of return then a fixed account that somebody just says, hey, I understand the interest rates are, you know, getting better, but I, I really want my money to have, you know, to have, have some decent growth in there uh, and grow with the market going up, not losing when the market goes down. Fixed index annuities, they serve their purpose. They're not going to be as risky as investments, and therefore they're not going to have as high of a return as investments. There's going to be a high, you know, a, a risk return aspect between investments and growth and variable related strategies versus the fixed and the fixed index related strategy. So, you know, understand that there's a difference there. But it could be a very uh, useful tool, especially in the current interest rate environment. Really, uh, you know, since right around February, March of 2022, 
We've been seeing good things regarding the fixed index annuity space, primarily ones that do not have riders attached to those sorts of accounts. And then the fixed MIGAs have been doing well as well. And the main reason being because there's a correlation there. There's a correlation to interest rates. As interest rates rise, those attractive, those, those products get more attractive. As interest rates fall, those products get less attractive. So that's where you could go and, and, you know, seize the opportunity off of the increasing interest rate environment. Um, now when you're comparing fixed accounts, similar to how a fixed uh, annuity works, known as a MIGA, a multi-year guaranteed annuity, you can have a bank that offers a bank CD. Uh, insurance companies typically produce a higher rate of return. So that's where like an insurance MIGA might be paying 4% today for a shorter term, you know, duration versus a bank CD might be paying, you know, 3% or 2.5%. So typically give you about 1% to 2% higher when you're leveraging a MIGA or fixed annuity as opposed to, you know, a fixed account like a bank CD. Um, so that, that's where, you know, those differences would be. And that, that would be the pros of, you know, utilizing that route. So the next portion that I want to spend a lot of time on are the cons of an annuity and where individuals should be avoiding annuities or at least making sure that they're not falling victim to the common mistakes or the common traps that some of these marketing messages try to portray. The first thing is whenever we're talking about income or lifetime income, I'm not talking about old fashioned annuities and uh, by using a, uh, a type of mechanism known as annuitization. So what used to happen was an individual, similar to the opposite of the life insurance aspect, um, an individual would be paying monthly premiums or annual premiums into a life insurance policy. And then when that person passes away, a lump sum dollar amount would get paid over to the beneficiaries. The opposite of that was how the annuity concept was created. So what would occur would an individual would put a lump sum, give a lump sum to an insurance company, the insurance company would say, okay, based on this person's age, based on the law of large numbers off of how long somebody this age should statistically be living, we're going to make sure that this person will get paid a monthly or an annual income stream for the rest of his or her life, or sometimes you could leverage joint. The good side to that would be this individual that gave this lump sum dollar amount to the insurance company, they know that they're going to have a retirement check or a check every single month to the day they pass away. The downside to that is now they lost all control of that lump sum dollar amount because they gave it to the insurance company and in return to receive a, a, an income stream. So like as an example, if someone gave an insurance company $100,000 and they were set up with an annuitization uh, platform you know, regarding how they were receiving lifetime income. And let's say that the insurance company told them, okay, we're going to pay you, you know, $5,000 every year to the day that you pass away. And let's say this person's 60 years old. Well, if this person gives $100,000, and they're getting paid $5,000 per year. We know that after 20 years, if this person's 60 now, so any year after the age 80, that would make sure that this individual's winning. They're basically sticking to the insurance company. If the 60 year old lived to age 100, they would have been sticking it to the insurance company for 20 extra years past that break even point in this example. Now, the downside, and this is why annuities got very bad reps, is because when you're losing control, if you set up in a single life only option through annuitization and you give this hundred thousand dollars, this person's receiving five thousand, five thousand, five thousand. Let's say, God forbid, they only live for three years and they pass away. Well, they would have been paid. They would have given a hundred thousand dollars to the insurance company, would have received back fifteen thousand dollars. And now all their account balance goes back to the insurance company. That death benefit didn't go back to the beneficiaries because they lost control on the rights to these monies. So that's how old fashioned annuities and that's how annuitization factors work. Now, every annuity has access to an annuitization option. That's something that somebody should avoid at all costs because and there's different marketing terms with it or, you know, different advisors have different jokes on it. They call it annuicide. You're committing annuicide when you annuitize your money because you're losing that control. In the early 2000s, the first type of uh, contracts that came out were variable annuities with income riders, even though I hate variable annuities and I'll explain in depth why. Um, those sorts of mechanisms with the income rider allowed an individual to say, okay, place your money with an insurance company. They're going to produce you a lifetime income stream. But when you pass away, whatever's remaining in the account balance would get left over to beneficiaries. If let's say you want to walk away after X amount of years, you could take the account balance and walk away. So that income rider mechanism gives that individual the lifetime income stream, but the flexibility to walk away, the flexibility to have growth on their monies that are still sitting in their account balance, the growth to leave benefit, to leave money to those beneficiaries upon their death. So it opens up all that flexibility and all that control. 
On top of it, the longer that these income riders have been around, the more that these insurance companies have been able to understand the math and understand the actual data behind it. So now whenever they're offering their contractual guarantees on cash flow, many times that income rider play beats out annuitization options. So like as an example, let's say if somebody's going into a deferred income annuity, which is a type of annuitization mechanism, a DIA, and they say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to put $100,000 into this account. I'm you know, currently age 57. By the time I hit age 60, I'm going to be able to receive $5,000 every year to the day that I pass away or me and my spouse pass away based on that, you know, whatever the, the top product is that comes back. So you understand that this person gives $100,000 at age 57, they're going to be receiving a 5% or $5,000 cash flow per $100,000 that they're placing in there versus something that might be the best hybrid annuity with all that flexibility to leave a death benefit, to still have growth on your monies, uh, to still have a, a higher potential rate of return on your account balance and also having a higher cash flow, it might look something like this, where the same 57-year-old is putting $100,000 in there. They're waiting three years. After they hit age 60, they trigger their lifetime income mechanism. Instead of getting paid $5,000 per year, they're getting paid $7,000 per year. So this means that for the 100000 that they put in with the hybrid annuity, they're getting back a 7% cash flow per, or, uh, you know, 7% cash flow off of any dollar that they're placing in there or $7,000 per 100 grand that they're placing into that account. So with this option, with the hybrid annuity, their physical money is still, because it's with a fixed index annuity with an income rider, that still grows when the market goes up, gains 0% whenever the market goes down. Um, their account balance will get depleted by the withdrawals that they're pulling out. Also, if there's an income rider fee, which are typically hover around 1%, those would start to reduce the account balance. But whenever this person passes away, whatever's remaining in the, in the, uh, in the account balance would get left over to beneficiaries. If this person keeps living and living and living and living and they live past that break even point, the, and their, their account balance is zero dollars, the insurance company is still on the hook to keep paying them their lifetime income stream. If let's say they're in this plan for you know five years, seven years, ten years, whatever that duration is, that restricted duration is, and they want to take their monies and walk away because interest rates are really high and they can get a better you know return of just getting a, a you know fixed uh, fixed interest play, they could go and they have the flexibility to walk away you know for, with their dollars. So this side produces a higher cash flow, produ produces much better flexibility. Uh, versus the traditional sense of just leveraging annuitizations with SPIA, single premium immediate annuities, and DIAs, deferred income annuities, or QLAX, qualified lo uh, longevity annuity contracts. And that's where, you know, by just looking underneath the hood and looking at the math behind it, you could put yourself in a much better position and make sure that you're able to go with a situation that you're using less dollars to accomplish your goal as opposed to putting more dollars into an inferior strategy and an inferior product with potentially an inferior carrier. So I didn't want to spend too much time on annuitization, but it's important to know the difference because individuals that have set up annuities in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, that's an entirely different ball game than what the ones that are being offered today are. You have a lot better features. You have, you know, a, a lot more mechanisms that you could attach to what your goal is to make sure that if I'm placing X amount of dollars in there, I'm able to leverage it. This is why I would be leveraging it, but this is the different things to avoid. Um, so, you know, typically what we see is the, the accounts, the hybrid annuities with the income riders, those are going to be the most favorable. Now, the main con to that is phantom accounts, income based. So, the way on how an income rider works and how to really decipher a good one from a bad one goes by a simple formula. The most important aspect of an income rider is to try to figure out how much income that it's going to produce you at a future date. That future date could be 30 days. That future date could be two years. It could be 10 years, 15 years, whatever that is. So whenever we hear, I'm offered a 7% guarantee on my money, where I'm offered a 5% guarantee on my money, and we're hearing that it's through an income rider, whether that's through a variable annuity with an income rider or a fixed index annuity with an income rider, what, what exactly does that break down to? And it, the simple formula goes by income base or benefit base multiplied by withdrawal rate percentage or payout percentage equals the lifetime income stream. So there's different variations to this, different marketing messages there. 
if we had company A and we were looking underneath the hood, because be mindful, there's hundreds and hundreds of carriers in an individual state for an individual situation when they're trying to accomplish the goal. So what we're doing is we leverage proprietary software behind the scenes and we say, okay, which company is going to give this person the best possible income stream, the best possible flexibility? If we had company A that came back, and let's say there was only two carriers, but there was two carriers that came back and we're trying to decipher, okay, which one's better than the other. We had an individual that was age 60. He was looking to retire at age 65, so a five-year deferral. And we had company A that was going to give this person a 7% guarantee on their roll-up rate on their income rider on their benefit base versus company B that was going to give this person a 5% guarantee. Which one's going to produce them more income at age 65? So you would look at this and say, well, 7% is a higher number than five. I'm not an idiot. I'm going to go with company A. That's not so fast. The companies know this. So what they do is they create a bullshit marketing message. And what they'll have is company A with their 7% guarantee for a male age 65 might have a payout percentage, a withdrawal rate percentage of 4%, while company B with the smaller roll-up has a payout percentage for a male age 65 of 5%. So if we do the math, and I just kept this as simple interest, so many times you have the roll-up guarantee is goes by compound interest, but just for really easy math, after the first year, this person's benefit base, not their real money, their phantom account, their fictitious account, their calculation account, rolls up to 107,000. The next year, 114. The next year, 121. The next year, et cetera, et cetera. So at age 65, this person's benefit base is 135000 Their physical money is growing when the market goes up, gaining 0% whenever the market goes down. Growing when the market goes up, gaining 0% whenever the market goes down. So that's what their account value is doing. That's their physical money. That's not what's going to determine the lifetime income stream. What's going to determine the lifetime income stream is going to be the benefit base multiplied by the withdrawal rate percentage. So in this example, we understand that a male age 65, if they put 100000 in there, the combination of the 135,000 multiplied by their payout rate, which is determined by how old this person is, and each carrier has a different payout rate, would give this guy 5,400 bucks. Versus company B, even though the income base is, di is lower, their payout rate was higher. So therefore the combination between the income base and the payout rate equaled $6,250. So what this tells us is company A, for any dollar that we place in with company A, they're going to produce this person a 5.400% cash flow. Company B, for any dollar we're placing in there with company B, and we wait five years, they're going to produce this guy a 6.250% cash flow. Meaning if they gave 200000 with company A, the company A is going to give this person back 10800 bucks. 200,000 multiplied by 5.400%, $10,800. Same thing over here. 200,000 multiplied by 6.250 would be $12,500. So even though this larger number, it looked like it was going to give this person a, a better result when we looked underneath the hood and we realized, no, 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 that was, that was bullshit. That was a phantom account. That would, that was basically a, a roll up guarantee that they just tried to manipulate to have this person get suckered into this plan because seven sounds sweeter than five. That's what we're doing when we're looking underneath the hood and we're saying, okay, which carries the better ones, you know, behind the scenes. And this is why when you have hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of, or a little over a thousand different options for an individual situation, why would you go with something that could be 50th place versus something that could be first place or second place? And that's going to be the difference off of how much money that you're going to place with the best possible, the superior product, as opposed to going with a product because the marketing rep was really nice or that financial advisor that kept pushing it and shoving it down your throat was really nice. At the end of the day, math is math, science is science. You can't, the numbers don't lie when you're dealing with, with the, you know, the, the income streams with these types of hybrid annuities and types of lifetime income, uh, you know, lifetime income riders. So the large takeaway is don't get caught up on the shiny object. Don't just, you know, take the phantom account for its word. That's not a true guarantee on your money. Different things that you'd be mindful of when you're looking to leverage this for a lifetime income stream is, you know, if it does have an income rider, what's the cost of that income rider? 
it is an extreme. Is it, you know, free? Some, some income riders are built into plans where they have free income riders that's attached into that to sort of, a, you know, account. Um, some of them have, you know, extre- extremely high fees. And that's why I do not like variable annuities is because their phantom accounts might look really nice. But when push comes to shove and it shows how much lifetime income that someone's going to be receiving, those are significantly lower than the top fixed index annuity with income options on there. On top of it, the, the fees with the variable annuity are significantly higher. You have five, six times as high of what you would have with a typical fixed index annuity with an income rider. Um, also with variable, if the market goes down, that, that, that account balance is going to get hindered with it. So you not only have the pressure of the fees, the pressure of the withdrawals, but you also have pressure of downward market loss potential onto that account as well. So I hope that that makes sense. Once again, if you have any questions or you want to see which would be the best option for you, feel free to give our 1-800 number a call. Um, the other thing is when somebody likes the concept of a fixed index annuity with it, uh, without the income rider, so just a safe accumulation type of fixed index annuity, which I was mentioning on the pros list, you have to look at also the cap limits. If you have one account that has a cap of, you have an uncapped strategy as an example, or a cap of, let's say, 12%, versus another account that has a cap of 5% and it has the same index, well, whenever this index goes up, you have a much higher potential rate of return and a much better historical average rate of return with the higher cap limit than than obviously the smaller one. So like as an example, let's say if that specific index gains 15% the first year, then it loses 10% the second year, then it gains 10% the third year, then it loses, you know, uh, 7% the fourth year, and then let's say it gains 3% the fifth year. Well, the one with the smaller cap, with the 5% cap, when it went positive 15%, this would have gained a credit of 5%. When it lost 10, it would have gained zero. When it gained 10, it would have gained 5%. When it lost seven, it would have gained zero. When it gained three, it would have gained three. Versus this other company, we'll call it company B, when it gained 15, this one gained 12. When it lost 10, this gained zero. When it gained 10, this gained 10 because 10 is still underneath the cap of 12. When it lost seven, this gained zero. When it gained three, this gained three. So when we add this all up, this one gave a positive 25% rate of return versus this one, which only had a positive 13% rate of return after five years. Obviously, this one was a, was a better product, was a superior product because the cap rate was higher. You also have participation rates. What that means is you might have like an uncapped strategy with a participation rate. So if you have a participation rate of 100%, that means whatever it gains, you're going to gain. If it comes back negative, you're going to gain 0%. If it, maybe you have a participation rate of 120%, meaning whatever the index gains, you're going to get 120% of those gains. But if it comes back negative, it's going to gain zero. So that's very favorable, especially in today's, well, as the Fed keeps increasing interest rates, we start to see those, in, those interest rate change uh, some of the more attractive products out there. Those are different things to be mindful of. Uh, other things are high spread. So what a spread is, it basically is, it's like a fee, but the fee is only comes out whenever that account is positive. So what I mean by that is let's say you have the two examples, company A, and they have an uncapped strategy with a 1% spread. Company B has an uncapped strategy with a 3% spread. And let's say that the market gained 10 with the, the, these are both similar indexes that are linked to it. Company A would receive a positive 9% credit. Company B would receive a positive 7% credit because it was whatever the gain was minus the spread. Let's say if the market dropped 10% the next year, this would gain zero, this would gain zero. So the spread doesn't hurt when the market goes down because there's still a floor of that 0%. And this is primarily on the fixed index annuity space. But it is important to know which ones are the good ones, which are the the bad ones. Also, you might have some longer durations of uh, flexibility with your annuity account. So meaning if you want to fully remove your monies and walk away, you might have an account that's a five-year account, meaning that after five years, you could fully walk away with your money without any sort of restrictions or surrender penalties versus another one that's a seven-year versus another one that's a 10-year. What we've noticed is some of these five years and these seven years have popped up and we have these nice little sweet spots where individuals are only selling the 10 year durations. So that's something to see, okay, you know, are there sweet spots based on your situation? If you're looking to retire in the next five years or seven years, why would you get set up into a 10 year restricted account if, you know, this one could actually produce a, a reasonable rate of return and get you to that finish line successfully and accomplish your goal successfully? So, you know, it's little things like that, that the little cons, a little, 
um, things that you want to avoid and, and not step on those little traps. Variable annuities, which I mentioned, um, the only positives to variable annuities is let's say if you're a high net worth individual and they have monies and they want to, uh, they have their monies in, in a cash position, like a non IRA position, and they're looking to just try to defer the taxes. And they might have, you know, a, a frequency of trades that are, that are basically happening. They're leveraging investments and they're doing constant buying and selling of trades. If that was set up in a brokerage account, they could get dinged with a capital gains tax each time that that trade is, is being triggered. If they're placing it within a variable annuity without any sorts of bells and whistles and fees and riders and all of that, that's where somebody could leverage a variable annuity. Now, the ones that I absolutely hate are the ones that are trying to get set up and they're masking themselves to produce a lifetime income stream. So those are ones that have a whole multitude of fees. You have a mortality and expense related fee. You have an admin charge. You have sub account related fees, which are kind of like, uh, think of them like mutual fund or expense ratios that are tied to that. You have financial advisors that they attach advisory fees onto those specific accounts. Um, you have the insurance related costs with these sorts of accounts. You have an income rider fee. You have a death benefit rider fee. There could be up to 10 to 13 different types of fees or even sometimes more than that uh, whenever you're looking underneath the hood in the prospectus of the variable annuity that you're interested in. At the end of the day, why are you placing your money into anything? If you're trying to leverage your money for an income stream, put it with the best income related product, income related account. Variable annuities are not going to get you to that finish line if for that income play. If let's say you're leveraging it for a safe accumulation play, well then go with something that's going to give you the best possible growth with no downward market losses, with no fees that are hindering it. That's where variable annuities will not work. So really the crux of this entire video is stay in your lane. Figure out what you're trying to do and make sure that you're breaking it down into simplistic versions to say, if I'm putting a dollar into something and I have a cost associated with it, is that warrant? Is that, is it justified? You know, does, does that, does that cost make sense? So like an income rider fee, that's, that's, you know, half of a percent or 1%, that might make sense to leverage something there. If, uh, let's say you feel as if, you know, you want to go and, and be super aggressive with your monies, well, that's something that an annuity is not going to accomplish. It's not going to give you this astronomical rate of return. It, it, it's, it's more of that safety play. So that's where you have to keep it in its lane. If you're looking for emergency needs, monies that you're able to uh, easily access at the drop of a hat to say, hey, I want this $100,000 sitting here, but you know, in a couple of weeks, I want to be able to pull out 10 grand, 20 grand. Well, then you don't want to go into a restricted product. You don't want to have those restrictions and, and ultimately hurt you. So make sure that you're always staying in your lane. Uh, one of the ways that we try to explain these things um, is using a, a type of formula or, or a type of idea known as the three things scenario. So it helps you organize things. So there's three things that every individual needs to figure out before they're retired or if they're currently retired, how to stay retired forever. The number one thing is income. The number two thing is emergency. And then the number three thing is inflation and growth. So if somebody has a million dollars as that example with assets, and we look underneath the hood and we understand that their budgeting analysis comes back that they have you know, $90,000 of expenses, but they're receiving, them and their spouse, let's say, are receiving $70,000 from Social Security income. They don't have a pension income stream. They don't have any other income streams. And we have a $20,000 gap there. Well, then say, okay, well, let's look underneath the hood. What's the safest way to make sure to close that gap of $20,000? Maybe it might say to put $200,000 into an IRA annuity account and trigger the income at their ideal retirement date. And that's what's going to produce them the $20,000 of cash flow. That created account number one. Step one was, was accomplished. We know worst case scenario, they have the social security income, they have the annuity income stream, and then that will at least accomplish what their expense need is. Step two, emergency. So in this example, this person now has 800,000 remaining. Maybe because they have $90,000 of expenses, they want to leave $100,000 on the sidelines in case of an oh my gosh moment or $50,000, whatever that is. We're going to call it $100,000. This might be account number two that was created in a money market account or a savings account or a checking account, something that's completely liquid that they could access. So instead of $800,000, now they have $700,000 remaining. Well, the $700,000 now can be set up for an inflation or a growth related strategy because maybe the annuity doesn't have step ups in it. It has level income. And the social security income, you're not confident that 
it's going to have a cost of living adjustment associated there. So we want to make sure that there's certain step ups in there. This is where the extra 700,000, maybe a portion of it will be super aggressive and that's where investments will come into play. A portion of it could be say, you know, set up in the safe accumulation play. Another portion of it could be set up in the fixed play. So this is where you could now create account number three, account number four, account number five. But each one is serving its purpose. The super aggressive one is something that the annuities can't do. The, this, you know, the fixed one might be with a bank CD. And that's something that, it, you know, an annuity, you know, instead, if they don't want to go with a MIGA, um, and they want to, you know, keep it with a bank, well, then they leverage a, a bank CD with it. That could be, you know, number five. And then number four could be the safe accumulation, the fixed index annuity without the income rider. So now what, what we basically did was we took one type of scenario with this individual's assets and we created safety. We said, we have a safety net now. You could spend your money however you desire throughout retirement. You don't have to worry if the market's crashing. Your money is not going to go down with it or your income is not going to stop because we made sure to protect it. We made sure to put that sort of insurance in place. Your emergency need, we're keeping those monies on the sideline. So now all those extra dollars could be set up for that, you know, growth related need to leave money to beneficiaries, to use that as a splurge account, to go and travel and do your golf, you know, every weekend or, uh, you know, go on vacations, visit grandkids, whatever that is. But by creating these different mechanisms and looking at them as individual pieces in a puzzle, it's staying in its lane. When it works is when you're able to map out everything correctly and you're not trying to use the, use the product or use the account for something that's not designed for. When it doesn't work is when somebody throws too much money. They like the idea, so they throw all their money into one area. I love, you know, the, the growth idea of investments, but I need some income, but you know, I've always been comfortable with investments, so I'm just going to go with investments. That might not work with your financial plan. Uh, just like, you know, annuities. Hey, I'm, I'm super aggressive, uh, but I like that concept of growing in the market going up and not losing when the market goes down. Well, if you really like the thrill of the, and the roller coaster of the market, and you really want to have those astronomical rates of return, you might want to leave all your money in investments. That's where an annuity is not going to work out. So, you know, it, it's just sticking to its lane and making sure that you're not overstepping it. You're putting the smallest dollars in there. You're trying to save as much money as possible, trying to keep it in the step three bucket as much as possible so that you're winning with flexibility and peace of mind, you know, at the end of the day throughout retirement. I know this video was a little bit lengthy, but I felt it necessary. You know, if you found value in this video, feel free to give her a 1-800 number a call and, uh, you know, reference this video and, and ask to speak directly with a specialist and we'll put you up on a calendar, you know, based on what time works best for you. And um, you know, we, we do things a little bit differently. We like to make sure that all of our clients are educated the best way possible, um, that they're taking their time, they're absorbing the information, and they're seeing the math and they're seeing the science behind it. And it says, okay, yes, that, that makes sense. I want to go and leverage this portion here, this portion there. And they're becoming part of the process. So, um, you know, that, that's what we've, we've really seen, you know, the difference between us and other companies throughout the country um, is just, you know, individuals are more educated. They, they understand what they're getting. Um, and they're not feeling rushed and they know that whatever those recommendations are, if they're using annuities as an example, we're giving them the best possible options in their area. Um, as opposed to being biased towards one company over the next, we want to see which one is actually going to give, you know, which one's going to be, allow us to squeeze the most amount of juice from it, the most amount of leverage from it so that it's leaving as much money and as much flexibility, uh, you know, with you guys at the end of the day, the end of the year. Um, to not stress throughout retirement. So, um, you know, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Retire Sharp, so you have access to the most updated videos. And we look forward to speaking with you. Thank you so much.